Today's webinar will discuss preclinical optical imaging of infectious diseases. The content was generated by Dr. Kevin Francis, and the presenter is Dr. Julie Soprino. Perkinomer provides a wide variety of detection and imaging systems in order to analyze increasing cellular complexity. One can use the lab chip, Envision, Victor systems, or Ensight for DNA, RNA, and protein analysis, and then move into live cell imaging using the movie site, which is a live cell imaging system designed to operate inside your cell culture incubator. This enables you to maintain your cells under optimal conditions and perform a wide range of assays in a variety of culture vessels. For imaging cells, the Apparatus CLS high content system combines speed and sensitivity powerful and intuitive data analysis you've come to trust from the Apparatus platform. The Opera Phoenix Plus high content screening system is the premier confocal solution for today's most demanding high content applications. The Phoenix Plus is specifically designed for high throughput high content assays, phenotypic screening, and fast response assays, such as calcium flux or cardiomyocytes. The confocality of Operetta CLS and Opera Phoenix provides focused light penetration further into today's complex 3D cell model systems, including organ on the chip models. Finally, as far as model organisms, where our discussion will be focused today, Perkin Elmer provides a variety of in vivo imaging platforms, as well as informatics and automation solutions. Since this webinar will focus on optical imaging, we wanted to point out some of our preclinical imaging platforms. We have an array of systems designed to suit a variety of imaging needs. From benchtop systems, the Lumina series, which can image 2D, bioluminescence, and fluorescence, and some are equipped with an X-ray overlay. We also have systems, the Ibis Spectrum series, which can produce both 2D planar and 3D tomographic images, as seen here. Our quantum micro CT system provides a high resolution scanning solution. For those of you unfamiliar, when imaging bioluminescent bacteria or cells, the basic methodology as shown here is if you're dealing with bacteria, you can use a 5G operon with a cassette that has both luciferase and aldehyde synthesis genes. So you can engineer a bacteria which will glow constitutively or under the control of a desired promoter. Perkin Elmer's own Kevin Francis was one of the first people to engineer the operon to work in gram-positive bacteria. If you put this into transposons, you can engineer virtually any bacteria to monitor gene regulation from these different strains. Of course, you can use a repertoire of different genes, which you will see today, such as firefly luciferase, and nanoluciferase, which can also be engineered into viruses. Once you've engineered the luciferase or fluorescent protein into, for example, a capsid of a virus or a genome of bacteria, these virions or cells can be put into an animal model. These animals can then be imaged using our IBIS platforms, one of which you see here, the IBIS Spectrum CT, which can actually image up to 10 mice at once in 2D. The image at the bottom right comes from Imperial College with James Collins and Gad Frankel and shows Citrobacter rodentium, which can serve as a model for inflammatory bowel disorders. There is a vast array of optical reporters to choose from. The most common luciferase for in vivo imaging is firefly luciferase, and this was the first one to be used in cancer studies and has since been used routinely across many different disease areas. Before nanoluciferase, the smallest luciferase was developed, the next smallest luciferases were Gaussia and Ranilla. These luciferases do not require ATP, so you can actually use both Firefly and these ATP independent reporters in combination to report on the metabolic state of cells. In addition, a very wide range of fluorescent proteins can be used in the IBIS platforms. As you can see here in this image from the late Roger Chen, fluorescent proteins range from blue all the way to the far red. There are pros and cons to using luciferases and fluorescent proteins. 
Luciferases will have much higher sensitivity in vivo, while fluorescent proteins have high utility both in vitro and in ex vivo in terms of things like facts and microscopy. More recently, some researchers are using fusion proteins. For example, by fusing something like nanoluciferase to a fluorescent protein, you would actually get two emission peaks, one from nanoluc and one from the fluorescent protein, which was actually excited directly by the nanoluciferase, resulting in a very bright emission and allows for greater tissue penetration of the light. Other reporters that can be imaged in the IBIS platforms are based on chemiluminescence, Cherenkov luminescence, phosphorescence, and a wide variety of fluorescent dyes. Variants of fireflow luciferase have been engineered wherein the peak emission is shifted into the red end of the visible spectrum in order to increase depth penetration. However, in certain instances, this can result in a reduced quantum yield. Alternatively, variants of luciferin substrate have been generated to try to improve in vivo performance without necessarily optimizing enzyme binding. Recent improvement approaches, as seen in this study from UC Irvine, involve generating mutant luciferase libraries and screening for orthogonal pairs. Here, an initial on-plate screen identified functional luciferase mutants, and secondary screening was then performed for orthogonality with other mutants and luciferin analogs. A great example of this type of strategy is shown by the stellar light production of the Akaluk and Akalumin system. This study, published in Science, out of Riken, the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Kyoto University, and the University of Electrocommunications, shows the vastly improved sensitivity of bioluminescence imaging using this novel reporting system in both mice and marmosets. You can clearly see higher light intensity with the ACA system compared to firefly luciferase when imaging the same numbers of cells both in the lungs and the brain of mice. Further, the sensitivity of the system is highlighted by the ability to image bioluminescence in the brain of a marmoset after a five millimeter deep injection of an adeno-associated virus expressing this reporter. Today's discussion is going to focus on the imaging of infectious disease. However, we'd like to point out that the imaging possibilities using the IBIS platform are virtually endless. In fact, there are over 12,000 peer-reviewed publications that utilize the IBIS. A small sample of the biological applications published using our technology are shown here, from agro-microtartar plates to plants to insects and fish to mice, of course, and other ex vivo examples. To begin our discussion on using optical imaging for imaging infectious disease, we'd like to start with this publication from a group at NIAID, Emory, in Wisconsin. This is a flu study where they used nanoluciferase, which was necessary because the flu genome is very small. And thus, if firefly luciferase were used, its size would cause viral attenuation. The small size of nanoluc proves to be advantageous here. Even though it is very blue, it is also very bright, allowing for deeper tissue imaging, as you can see coming from the lungs. In this publication, they performed both vaccine and immunotherapy studies, of which the immunotherapy study is shown here. In the middle row, you can see where they used uh, immunotherapy as a prophylaxis. So they administer the antibody before the infection was administered. You also see an example of using the antibody as a therapy during the infection. Both instances showed reduction of the viral load as compared to control, which is of course able to be visualized using the IVIS imaging technology. Here's another example with both luciferase and fluorescent protein engineered into the virus. This gives the best of both worlds. They can use the bioluminescence to easily determine plaque forming units in the lungs in vivo, and ex vivo be able to use the fluorescent recorder to be able to determine spatially where the disease is located in the lungs. And then of course, they could also use the proteins in high resolution microscopy, which is very common with these reporters. This study was performed at the University of Rochester and the Animal Health Center in Madrid. Here's another example highlighting the versatility of optical imaging. You can label a virus via genetic engineering 
and put the reporter molecule inside the viral capsid so that when the RNA or DNA is incorporated into the cell, you get a bioluminescent signal. Or you could engineer it so that a smaller reporter, such as nanoluciferase or gaussiolucifrase, is on the outside of the capsid in order to track the virions. This example actually used pronuclear microinjection to engineer the animal itself. Here, they were able to image a cytokine pathway in the lungs using luciferase and monitor inflammation in the lungs that correlated with viral progression. With the advancements in reporter development since this paper was published, you could even perform dual imaging by labeling the virus with nanoluciferase in order to monitor the disease progression along with the host response, as shown here. In this publication, done at Xenogen, they used an alternative to transgenic models, which can be very expensive and laborious to produce. They took two different genetic reporter constructs using loop 2 and fused them to TNF-alpha, NF-kappa-B, and interleukin-8, so they have both cytokine and chemokine examples. They delivered the constructs with jet PEI into, into the tail vein of the animal under low pressure. This then transformed the lung epithelium, and the animal stayed transformed for a few months. At first, you can see background for about a week or two, until the background signals start to disappear around the two-week mark. Upon delivery of lipopolysaccharide to the lungs, you can immediately see cytokine and chemokine signal return via bioluminescence imaging. What this means is that you can transform animals such as mice, rats, and ferrets with these constructs and monitor different genetic pathways in the lungs. This is a promising and cost-effective alternative to transgenic animal models. This example is very pertinent to the state of the world today and is from the INRS and University of Quebec. This is showing the imaging of a coronavirus infection, but it is in fact not SARS-CoV-2. It is causing a neuroinvasive infection in this mouse model. You may recall that some of the symptoms of COVID-19 are loss of taste and smell, and this can be an early indicator that the CNS is being affected by the virus. In rare cases, these viruses can spread to the brain and cause encephalitis. This example uses firefly luciferase engineered into the virus as the coronavirus genome is larger than the flu. In this case, the authors were able to track the viral tropism in the animal and also use microscopy to show exactly how it was moving in the CNS. In this study from Harvard Medical University and Peking, Peking University, they wanted to intuitively see how enterovirus infected these animals. Because of the small size of the enterovirus, they are very hard to engineer. So they instead took a different approach where they took firefly luciferase and integrated the C3 proteolytic cleavage site into it. So when the cleavage site is in between the N and C terminus of the luciferase, it is non-functional and you would not see any bioluminescent light. But when the site is cleaved, the protein is able to refold and become functional again and would thus produce bioluminescence. They then introduced the split construct intracerebrally and infected some of the animals with enterovirus 71. In the sham animals, which have received the construct but no virus, no luciferase signal is seen. But animals that have the construct and that were infected with the enterovirus, you were able to see luciferase signal due to the C3 cleavage by the virus. This is a clever way to monitor the virus without actually engineering it. Zika virus is a serious disease that causes brain abnormalities during early development. However, a glimmer of hope surrounding this virus comes from research out of Brazil that also uses the Ibis technology. The group hypothesized that since Zika virus preferentially infects neural progenitor cells, that maybe it could act as an oncolytic agent against CNS embryonic tumors that are particularly aggressive. After implantation of both medulloblastoma, shown in the DAOI, in USP13, and atypical teratoid, the USP7 cells, the authors were able to monitor the oncolytic effect of a Zika virus as the tumor cells expressed firefly luciferase. It was seen that distinct CNS tumor types may have different sensitivity to the Zika virus, as shown here with the DAOI versus the other two cell types. 
And in some of the cell types more sensitive to the Zika virus, you could see clearance in as fast as two to three weeks. So now we will move on to some examples into bacterial imaging. This is one of the first examples of an X-ray overlay with optical images, both using bioluminescent and fluorescence. This is using a dual labeled salmonella, which expresses both bacterial luciferase or LUX and the M cherry fluorescent protein. And this will allow for the visualization of a GI infection. The X-ray overlay after the addition of a barium sulfate contrast agent allows for a very nice delineation of the GI tract and a better anatomical understanding of where the optical signals are coming from. This work is from Imperial College showing a beautiful image from the IBIS spectrum CT. The duty image on the left shows bioluminescent Citrobacter rodentium colonizing to the sequel patch. The animal was administered a CT contrast agent, allowing for exquisite anatomical visualization using micro CT co-registration with the 3D reconstruction of the optical bioluminescent signal. The co-registration enables better understanding of infection localization and signal intensity at depth. This is an example of a UTI bioluminophritis model where bioluminescent E. coli were administered directly into the bladder of mice. In these types of studies, typically only about half of the animals will develop bioluminophritis. However, upon inspection of the 2D bioluminescent images, it may appear that both mice do in fact exhibit pyelonephritis. When the animal on the left was imaged in 3D using the iris spectrum CT, you can clearly see the E. coli in the ureter and one kidney, which is expected of this model around the two week mark. When the animal on the right was imaged in 3D, you can see that the bioluminescent signal is actually coming from the GI tract, indicating that the animal likely infected itself after ingesting waste-tainted materials. The importance of 3D imaging with CT co-registration becomes very clear here, as the images taken in 2D look very similar to each other, but in fact are completely different underneath the surface. This final example is a study from UCLA, University Medical Center Groningen, and Perkinelmer, utilizing the Abbey Spectrum CT to image a bioluminescent Staph aureus biofilm on a pin implanted in the L4 vertebrae, along with a fluorescently labeled antibody 1D9680 that specifically binds to the Staph aureus bacteria. Here, we are able to visualize the bioluminescent bacteria, shown in blue, along with the co-localization of the fluorescently labeled antibody 1D9, shown in orange. Due to the broad range of filters in the IVA spectrum CT, we were also able to distinctly visualize vancomycin that was labeled with an 800 nanometer fluorescent reporter, and we saw what was to be expected, that it works well in the short term, but in the long term tends to break down and move around the animal. Thank you for attending our webinar covering optical preclinical imaging of infectious disease.